Come on, church. Let's elevate our faith this morning. I know it's early. Come on, let's give God some praise. Let me say it this way. If you made it through the week and your week looked like hell and God got you through, let's give him praise for saying, I'm here. I made it. I made it. I'm kind of, I'm about ready to fall over, but I made it. I made it. I'm so grateful that we can come to a place. Do you know why we come here? We come to elevate our faith. Not to sit here and be the same person as last week. I believe that Jesus said, he who has ears, let them hear. He's putting it on us. If you have ears, open them up and listen. I promise you I'll give you something that can change your life. Who's expecting for God to give you a life-changing word this morning? Come on. Let's give God praise in this place. We're so glad you guys came out. We're doing something a little bit fun this morning, and I believe God is going to work through it. Uh, we are actually have three experiences. We have a 9 o'clock, we have a 11 o'clock, and we have a 6 o'clock. Um, and God has been blessing this ministry, and we've expanded to make more room. That's why there's seats that are open next to you. Pretty much what that means is you need to take that invite card next to you and say, I'm bringing someone with me next week, because yeah. we are all about the invite, because people need Jesus, including myself. And, uh, and so we are having three different speakers today. We're going to have my wife, who's going to share. We're going to have Chris, our worship director, and then our student director, Jake, is going to share. Uh, and I just want to let you know that you're like, who is it going to be? It's the 9 o'clock, and you came at the right experience because today you get to hear from none other than our worship director, Chris Hageman, who's going to be sharing. And guys, he has a word. He's been preparing and praying and asking me all questions this week, and he's just got something for you if you lean in. Like, this is the moment where we lean in. So we're going to pray for him as a church, and we are not going to look and cheer him on. We're going to say, God, what are you going to speak through Chris that I need? Because I know that I need some stuff that God has given Chris in my own life. And so I'm going to lean in as the pastor as well to know that not every time, if you are a learner, everything will be a teacher, right? Yeah. Lord, we thank you so much, Father God, for what you're doing. We pray over Chris right now. We pray, Father God, Lord, that you would anoint his words. We pray, Father God, he has prepared he has listened, and I just pray right now, Lord, that he's just going to be obedient, and your word is going to speak through him, and it's going to be powerful. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Expand our faith, Lord. We want a word that will change us forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give it up. Honor Chris. Thank you so much. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Worship team, you can go head on off. Um, this is going to be a little bit weird for me because there's no music. There's no guitar in my hand. I don't really know what I'm doing here. So, uh, no, but thank you, Pastor Sean. Thank you for all the encouragement this week. Thank you for helping me out. Um, I literally asked him at least 6,000 questions. Um, and, you know, as, as I begin my talk here, I just want to remind you guys we're in a series called Venom right now, and we're talking about these specific venoms in our lives called fear and anxiety. And it was crazy because when Sean came to me and he was like, hey, you're going to preach, uh, the two venoms that just filled my life were fear and anxiety. Um, I can tell you right now, I've probably experienced more anxiety than I have in a long time just this week, knowing that I'm going to speak to you guys. But I do believe that God has given me something special for you guys. Um, I believe that God gave me something special, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to to deal with fear and anxiety and then try to pass on to you what I think God spoke to me in this time. So we've been in this series. Pastor Sean kicked it off last week. It was amazing. Um, he does an amazing job. And now this week, I get to speak to you. Um, and, and little side note, this isn't on your screens, but I just want you to know ahead of time, this has just been on my heart. This message is actually called Practicing Peace. Um, and that's, that's something that I didn't put on the screens, I didn't even really want to make a title, but the more I got into the scripture, the more God was just showing me, this is all about practicing peace. And it's not about just practicing Chris peace or Sean peace or earthly peace, it's about practicing God's peace and what that looks like. So I don't know if you're struggling with fear or anxiety this morning, but I hope this word brings you some peace from God. Um, and as I was studying this week, uh, I actually came across an article um, while I was prepping for this message. And this article is about some weird experiment uh, where they took these mice and they actually conditioned them for fear. It was weird. They took a light and they shined it in front of these mice. And then at that same moment, they actually made a giant sound, like a big, scary, loud sound. And it would startle these mice and scare them. And they would do it every time, time after time. They would shine the light, make a big noise, Mice were scared. Shine a light, make a big noise. Mice were scared over and over, over and over, to the point where then they stopped making the noise and the mice were still scared. They would shine the light and the mice would freak out. And they were actually just conditioning them to be afraid of something. And you know, as, 
as I was reading that article and praying through what I was going to share with you guys today, I thought of a funny story from my childhood. Um, so when I was younger, I actually had a ventriloquist doll, which is really weird. I don't, I never like, <laughs> yeah. I never tried to do ventriloquism, but I think my grandpa at one time gave me some doll and I was like, oh, it's cool. He's like real classy. He had a top hat and a monocle and he was a cool dude. Um, and I had this toy and I'd play with him every once in a while. Um, and then one day I watched an episode of Goosebumps. Does anybody remember Goosebumps in here? Uh, for those of you who don't know what Goosebumps is, let me catch you up to speed real quick. Uh, Goosebumps was a book series that was actually for children, but it was a horror series. <laughs> Um, and I, don't, I don't know whose idea that was, but that's what Goosebumps started as, and then they made like a TV show, uh, and me as a kid, as a 90s kid, I watched Goosebumps, and I watched this one episode, and there was this doll named Slappy, and Slappy, for some weird reason, came to life and started terrorizing children, and it was absolutely terrifying for me because I had a ventriloquist doll who just happened to look like Slappy. Um, and I actually, I think we actually have a picture of Slappy to sh yeah, that's what Slappy looked like. And he, you guys can take that off because I'm going to have nightmares again. Uh, no, for real, take it down, goodness. <laughs> so it's, it's actually crazy to me because when I saw that story about these mice, it reminded me of Slappy, it reminded, my doll's name was Charlie, it reminded me of Charlie. And I saw that Slappy doll, I saw that episode and I was terrified of Charlie from then on. I was just absolutely terrified. And you know, <laughs> thinking about it more, it was just like, man, how many times in our lives do we have things that bring us great joy and something happens? And then those things just terrify us. Those things just fill us with anxiety. You know, because in my life it was like I had Slappy or I had Charlie and I saw Slappy and it scared me to death. And maybe for some of us it's, we've had a bad relationship and now you're terrified of men or women. You're terrified of relationships. Maybe you've been in a car accident before. I know I've been in a couple car accidents and it's like after a car accident, the last thing you wanna do is step foot in a car. Maybe you've had complications in a pregnancy before and you're pregnant again and you're terrified. And something that should be bringing you joy, something that should be lifting you up is actually filling you with anxiety. Maybe it's just something you've seen someone else go through. Maybe you're wondering, what if my kids grow up and they don't love Jesus? I have these friends and they're struggling with that right now. What if my kids grow up and they don't look like Jesus and they don't even have a relationship with him? What if someone close to me passes away? It happens all the time in our daily lives. And maybe a person who used to fill you with so much joy and happiness is now filling you with anxiety and fear because you're just thinking of the what ifs. You're just worried, you're anxious, you're fearful. And see, there was this guy in the Bible named Paul. He actually wrote most of our New Testament. And if anyone has anything to say about fear and anxiety and traumatic experiences, I think it's Paul. Um, Paul's conversion story, the way he came to know Jesus was actually a traumatic story. He was just walking on the road to Damascus. Jesus showed up after he had been risen from the dead, showed up in front of Paul. I don't know about you, but that would scare me. And then he was blinded because of that. And he had this whole big story. Uh, he was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was flogged. Uh, he had all of these traumatic experiences. And he writes this book called Philippians in the Bible. And today we talk about it in the church world as the book of joy. And it's like, man, I don't know about you guys, but I want to learn something about joy, something about peace from a guy who can go through all of that stuff and still find joy, and still write a book that today is called the book of joy. So we're actually going to be in Philippians right now, and that's the book of joy. That's what people talk about it as. And, and Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, and he's actually in prison, which again, blows my mind. The man's in prison, and he's writing a book about joy. I can't tell you how many times he says the word rejoice, or how many times he says joy in this book, but the guy's in prison at this moment, and he doesn't even know if he's going to make it to the next day. At any moment, they could just execute him because that's the way the government was at this time. If they wanted him dead, they'd just say, ah, kill him, he's dead, and he'd be dead. So we're going to be reading from that guy. I just want to put that into perspective for you. That's who is writing this letter, and that's who God chose to speak this message to. He says this in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. 
then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And Sean gave me this passage, and I was like, thanks, Sean, because this is one of the most frustrating passages, if we're really honest, honestly for me, because he opens up right out of the gate, and he's like, don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. And it's like, thanks, Paul. Uh, let me do that real quick. And then he says all these almost kind of Christian cliche things like, oh, just pray, just be thankful, just do all this stuff. God will give you peace. It'll all be good. Just don't worry or don't be anxious about anything. And so to be really honest, when I first got this scripture, I was like, what in the world am I going to tell these people? What am I going to say? I'm going to get up there and say, don't be anxious. See you later. All right, I'm out of here. But I really believe that if we just take a minute and just dig a little bit deeper, God has something he wants to show us here. See, because the first thing that Paul tells us to do is pray. And he doesn't just say to pray, but he says, instead of worrying about everything, pray. And it's cool because he kind of splits up worrying and praying as like two opposing things. And that's really hard for me because I'm a big worrier. I don't know about you guys. I'm a huge worrier. Sean last week talked about the worst, um, the worst case scenario and how he, that flashes through his mind all the time. That happens to me too. I deal with that all the time. Um, and actually, I get it honest. Um, sorry, mom, I'm, you're probably watching. But uh, my mom is a huge worrier. Uh, I remember one time as a kid going to the ocean and having a fun old time playing in the ocean. It was a great time. And then like 10 years later, we watched a video of that moment. And I think my dad's recording and my mom's standing by him and I'm out in the ocean and you can see me. And the only thing you hear is, Christopher, 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 come back here, get back here. Oh, Christopher, Christopher, come back here. Sorry, Mom. Uh, she was absolutely terrified that I was going to get swept away in the ocean, which, to be fair, I was young, I was little. It was probably a, a justified fear. But that thing that should have been bringing us joy in that moment, that ocean, that fun vacation we went on, was just absolutely sucking the life out of her in that moment. And so I say that to tell you, I'm that guy. I got that honestly. So I am a huge worrier. So this first statement, pray instead of worrying, is the absolute hardest thing for me. I don't know about you guys, but I have conversations in my head with people before I have them. Do you guys do that? Any of you guys? I do. And it's like, but what if they say this? And then I'll say this. And then they'll say this. And I spend all this time worrying and nothing gets done. You see, that's the thing about worrying is sometimes you're spending all this time worrying and you, you put all this energy into worrying and worrying not only makes it so that you don't get anything done, but you also make sure that you don't get anything done because you're not doing anything fruitful. You're just worrying. So Paul tells us to pray uh, and he splits it up versus worrying versus prayer. And that's kind of how I looked at this in my mind. And I thought to myself, you know, worrying, it's just talking to yourself. Like I just said, it's just talking to yourself. You're just thinking about all the things that could go wrong, all the things that have gone wrong, all of those things. And, you know, like I said earlier, I just talk to myself in my head all the time. I have conversations in my head before they even happen. And I spend all this time and energy, and it's just not worth it. And, you know, God tells us, hey, pray. In this scripture, Paul tells us, pray. And what praying is, is praying is just talking to God. And I know some of you are here and you're new, or maybe you've never prayed before, and you're kind of checking this church thing out, and this God thing out, and sometimes us church people don't really know what we're doing, and we use words that are confusing, so I just want to demystify this word really quick. Praying just means talking to God, especially in this text. That's all he's saying. Hey, instead of talking to yourself, why don't you spend time talking to God? That's what he's trying to tell us here in this moment. Don't worry, just pray, and you see, worrying is like a disease, man. It's this venom. It's this anxiety. And like for me, it was this sermon, to be really honest. Um, I spent probably a month worrying about what I was going to preach to you guys. And the funny thing about worry is it cripples you. And so I didn't even do anything about it. I just worried about it. Oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? I'm only going to have enough content to speak for five minutes. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's like this venom paralyzes you. This worry venom paralyzes you and keeps you from doing anything that can actually help you. And you see in Matthew 6, 27, it says this, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? That's Jesus talking. Can all your worrying at a single moment to your life. He's just saying, listen, you've been worrying, and worrying doesn't really accomplish anything. 
So why do it? Why do it? And I guess what I'm trying to say is that worrying has never added a single day to someone's life, but prayer has. Praying has. And yeah. And I mean, throughout the Bible, time after time, you see all these stories. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they're being almost put to death in a fiery furnace, right? And they just pray, and they say, you know what? God's got us. And they go into this fiery furnace, and God saves them. And you know what? Worrying didn't add a single day to their lives, but praying to the God of the universe did add so many days to their lives. Time after time, we look at Paul. There's so many times he could have been executed. All of Jesus' disciples could have been executed, and they prayed and, and consistently prayed. In my life, um, when I was probably, oh, like 12, uh, one of my grandparents, my grandma, actually got diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, and I remember praying profusely. Like, it was, it was the only thing I did. And, and looking back on it now, you know how they say faith like a child? I think in that moment I had faith like a child because I just knew God, was God, God had it. God was going to take care of it. Maybe I was young, maybe I was naive, but that's, that's where I was at. I was just like, God, I'm praying about this because you're the one who can heal. You're the one who can save our souls. So I guarantee that you can save our bodies. So I just kept praying and kept praying. And my grandma actually ended up in remission from cancer. And I know if you spend a little bit of time around these people in this room, you're going to hear story after story of people praying and people adding days to their life through prayer. So really, all I'm trying to tell you here, all Paul's trying to tell you here is make sure you're praying instead of worrying, because worrying doesn't accomplish anything, but prayer can add time to your life. How big is that? That's what prayer can do. And the next thing Paul tells us to do is he tells us to tell God what you need in this translation, but in most every other translation, it actually says, ask God for what you need. Why? Sometimes I think these things through, and I'm like, why? Doesn't God already know what I need? Doesn't God know everything? Why, why does he need me to ask him for things? Why does he need me to ask? And so I just start digging into the word, and you look at James 4, 2, and it says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And I look at scripture after scripture talking about ask God for what you need. Ask God for what you need. And I'm just like, God, why? I don't understand. Why do we need to ask you? And I started thinking about it, and maybe there are a couple reasons Maybe a few reasons that we need to ask God for things. I think maybe one reason is asking God for things reminds us that we need him. I think when we ask God for things, we're reminding ourselves of our dependence upon God. We're reminding ourselves, hey, listen, I can't get through this everyday life without God. So I need to pray. I need to be asking him for things. And when you ask him for things, he's a good God, and I believe he wants to give good gifts. So as we spend time praying, we begin asking We've been saying, God, I need this. Can you please help me? Can you deliver me this, from this anxiety? You know, I think about children. Uh, children ask all the time for things, don't they? Children are constantly asking, hey, can I have this? Can I have that? And it's because they can't do it on their own. And God is our loving Father in heaven sitting down looking at us and saying, you can't do it on your own. Just ask. I'm right here. And so this morning, I just want to remind you, he's up there. He's just waiting. Ask. He's a good God. You can ask him for things. I think also asking God for something reminds us that he can do it. It reminds us that he can do it. Because you don't ask people for things if you don't believe that they can do it. So it's like you're shoring up your faith. Like this week, I asked Sean a million questions because I've heard him preach before. I know he can preach. And in the same way, I think about God, it's like, man, how, many, how much more should I be asking God every day for everything that I need because he can do it? He's able to do more than we ask, more than we hope, and more than we could ever imagine. But sometimes we just don't ask. So Paul in this moment is saying, listen, you could spend time worrying, but you should be praying. Just talk to God. And as you're talking to God, just ask him for what you need. He's a loving father, and he wants to give you what you need. Think about children again. Children ask all the time because they believe that you can do it. I know for me, I don't know about you guys, but my mom and dad were like my biggest heroes when I was little. They could do anything. Like my dad was a cop. Um, and this probably isn't true, but in my mind it was true for a long time. Have any of you seen Taken? 
Um, the movie with Liam Neeson. So his daughter gets taken, and he's like an FBI agent or something, and he tracks her down, kills all the bad guys, and gets his daughter back. That's who I grew up thinking my dad was. <laughs> I was like, my dad's Liam Neeson. I don't have to worry about anything. It was incredible. I just didn't have to worry. And I think kids think about that. They think about their parents that way. And I think God calls us to faith like a child. And I think that's what he means. He wants us to look at him the same way that we looked at our dads one day. Maybe we looked at our moms. Maybe it was a grandparent. Uh, maybe it was a, a, just a relative or a friend. We need to look at them like that way. We need to look at God that way because he can do more than we could ever dream. And the last thing God asks us to do is thank Paul tells us to thank God for all that he has done. And in this moment, I know one thing he's talking about is the fact that God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for our sins. Because again, we couldn't handle it. We just don't have the capacity. And God said, I want to be in relationship with these people. I want to be in relationship with them. So he sent his son down. And so Paul says, ask and then thank and just remind yourself, remind yourself of what he's done. He's done so much for you. If he never, I've heard it said this way, if he never did another thing for you, he already did more than you could ever dream because he sent his son to die for you <clears throat> and to take your sins away. And so he's done so much for me and so much for you, so much for us. And it's a little weird just because as we, as we hear this, it's like, oh, thank God for what he's done in the past. But what I'm worried about is either in the present or the future. And it's like, Paul, why are you telling me to thank God in this scripture for all that he's done? Because I'm sitting here in the present or thinking about the future, and I'm worrying, and I'm anxious, and I'm fearful. And Paul's just like, hold on. Just take time to thank. And so I started looking up scripture after scripture that I could find, and I found 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And that's a crazy scripture because a lot of times we ask, what's God's will for my life? What's God's will for me? What do I need to be doing? And right here, Paul's telling us, God's will for your life is for you to be thankful in all seasons. And so even in those seasons of fear, even in those seasons of anxiety, we need to be thankful we need to be praying. We need to be saying, God, look at all that you've done. Look at everything that you've done. You've done so much for me. God clearly wants us to thank him. And, and I just, I think maybe one reason for that is that when we thank him for what he's done, it just reminds us, it encourages us. As that scripture said, you know, it's about reminding yourself, being thankful for all that he's done. It's reminding yourself. And this is the weird thing that I've kind of pieced together about God as I've been growing a little older and just kind of trying to think, God, you make things in such an intricate way. So what I'm trying to say is God tells us, here's a command, follow this command. And as people, as humans, we think, okay, I follow this command because God said so. I follow this command because he told me to and he wants me to, and I don't really know, but God needs it. So all throughout scripture, God tells us, you know, to praise him to thank him, to worship him, to sing songs about him. And sometimes he gets a little bit of a bad rap for that. It's like, God, why do you need all our praise? Why are you like so adamant about us always singing to you and giving you all this glory and all this praise and all this thankfulness? Like, do you really even need that God? And I th began to think about that more and more. And I thought about in the times when I'm the most scared, in the times when I'm the most worried, if I could just stop and thank him, what's actually happening is I'm reminding myself of everything he's done for me in the past. I'm reminding myself. I'm encouraging myself in the Lord, as scripture says, as David says. And I want to let you guys know, God tells us to praise him because he deserves it. He's good. He's holy. But we benefit. How many times have you ever sung a song before? I did it just five seconds ago. I was terrified about preaching this message. And we started singing these songs to God and thanking him for all that he's done. And I just said, God, please remind me of all the things you've done because I've got to preach in like five minutes and I don't know what I'm going to do. 
And it's a scary thing, but I was like near tears because I was just like thinking of all the times that he's brought me through things and all the times that I've said, God, I don't know if I can make it through this, but he brought me through anyways. There were so many times, and I know so many of you have experienced that. But what I'm trying to tell you is in those moments when you're paralyzed by fear, anxiety, and worry, stop, pray, ask God for what you need, and then begin to thank him for what he's done. Because I think that you start reminding yourself, you'll start encouraging yourself, and you'll start realizing that there's nothing to be afraid of because the God who created the universe is on your side. And it's funny because it's kind of like that mouse article that I talked to you about a little bit ago. Because, you see, they, they took these mice and they made them scared of this light. And then they decided, well, let's see if we can make them not scared of this light anymore. So they would shine a light and nothing would happen. And the mice would kind of freak out and they'd get scared, but it was okay. And then they'd shine a light and nothing would happen. And the mice would get a little scared and it'd be okay. And then they'd shine a light and they'd give the mice some food. And the mice were like, okay, I don't know what to think about this light thing anymore. And they'd shine a light and nothing would happen. And they'd shine the light and they'd give them some food and shine a light and give them some food and shine a light and nothing would happen. And after time, these mice began not to fear the light anymore. The thing that was once giving them all of this fear and all of this anxiety was no longer a source of any fear or anxiety. And I think about that in my life. I think that's what Paul's trying to say right here. You know what? Maybe there are some things that are giving you fear and anxiety. And maybe instead of relating those things that you're thinking about to all the what ifs, all the bad things, maybe you need to relate them to Jesus and how big he is. Maybe that's what he's saying when he's saying, thank God for all that he's done. You know why? Because he's done so much that if you just continue to associate those bad experiences with God pulling you through, maybe the next bad experience that you see coming, you're going to be like, no, it doesn't even matter because God's going to bring me through. He's got this. He's got this. And I think we'd start to look at our fears differently, just like those mice started looking at that light differently. They're like, no, this is okay. You know, because throughout Scripture, God tells us to consider it joy when we face trials. And it's like, man, maybe we're considering it joy because we already know the outcome. We already know what God's going to do. He's going to save us. He's going to free us from what we're dealing with. And maybe if we stopped thinking about the what if moments, and if we started thinking about the he did moments of our lives, our whole lives would be different. Our whole perspectives would change because we would just be excited about what he's going to do. I don't know about you guys, but that's how I'm trying to deal with my fear. And you know, it's crazy. This morning, I actually woke up at five this morning to try and prep for this message because I was like, oh, I got to prep. I got to get ready. I, I need to figure this out. I don't know if it's going to work. Am I going to do good or am I going to be nervous and blah, blah, blah. And I woke up at five and I was like, okay, God, I'm just going to pray through this because I'm learning that I need to pray and ask and thank. And so I said, God, I'm really nervous. I'm terrified. I don't know what I'm going to do or if I'm going to do any good, but I want to speak your words. So I began to pray over every section of this sermon. And about the time I got to the end of the sermon and I prayed through it for a few minutes, God was like, go back to sleep. I was like, hold on, God. I got to preach in a few hours. I need to read this about 75 more times. And he was like, go back to sleep. And my wife doesn't even know this. She's kind of like, what? So I literally just was like, I guess I'll set a new alarm. And I laid back down on the couch and I went to sleep because God was like, no, 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 Chris, don't you remember all the times that I've already done that? All the times I've already pulled you through? Don't you remember? And I had to say, yeah, I do. I do remember all those times. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and come on up. And, you know, I told you guys a little earlier that this message was called Practicing Peace. Um, and I think it'd be a little weird if I called a message practicing peace and I didn't give us a chance to practice some peace. So what's going to happen is the worship team's coming up. They're going to start a little bit of music. It's going to be real soft. And I just want to invite you all to stand with me. Go ahead and stand up. And we're going to practice this because I, I believe I did this this week so many times and it helped. I got here and I was like, I can do this. God's got this. I did this this morning. I prayed. I asked God for what I needed, and I thanked him for all that he's already done in my life. And it made my fear about this sermon trivial because God's done so much for me, and he's done so much for you. And it really puts things into perspective, how big our God is and how small our fears are sometimes. So what I want to do is, as this music's playing, I just want to invite you to just pray. 
just silently, maybe under your breath, just pray. For those of you, I want to remind you, if you're here for the first time, all this is is talking to God, and maybe you've never done that before, and that's okay. We're so glad you're here. I just want to give you this opportunity to try it. Just try it. Just press into this moment and say, okay, I'm going to try this God thing. I'm going to pray. So as the music begins to play, just bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray to God. Just talk with him. And now I just want to invite you to, to just ask him. There's so many people in this room. We all have different struggles. We all have different fears, different anxieties. And so in this moment, let's ask him for what we need. Tell him what you need. Tell him, God, this is, this is what I think I need. Tell me what I need. I don't even know. Just bring it before him and leave it at his feet. God, thank you so much for how good you are, how amazing you are. God, we've prayed. We've asked you for what we need. Lord, and we just leave it at your feet. Because when we give something to you, we give it all to you, Lord. We leave it right at your feet because you're the only one that can bring peace. And all these people in this room this morning are looking for your spirit and your peace right now because your scripture tells us that if we do those things, it says then we will experience the peace that passes all understanding. God, that your peace will guard our hearts and minds because, Lord, it's not that you just want us to stop worrying and stop being anxious. Lord, but you want to protect us from the venom of fear and anxiety. You want to lift us up, Lord, when we're down, when we're feeling low. You want to bring us out of it. You want to protect us from it, God. So, Lord, in this moment, we're going to lift our voices. We're going to sing a song corporately. We're going to thank you. We're going to worship you. We're going to praise you because you've already brought us out of the pit of hell and you've placed us at your side and said, this is my child. This is my son. This is my daughter. We are children of the most high God. And so this morning, I want us to sing like it. I want us to lift our hands. I want us to lift our voices and say, there is no greater call than giving you my all, God. Let's sing it out to him. Come on, church. <laughs> 